Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to host this daily conversation around all things dealing with the coronavirus crisis. We're covering three crises on the show, the health, financial, and racial inequality crises. We're always looking for guests and theme suggestions. Please email us, sri at sri.net. Today, we have a very special show for you. We're gonna be talking about food and climate security through the lens of the soil. And we have with us the winner of the 2020 World Food Prize and Professor of Soil Science at The Ohio State University, Dr. Ratan Lal, who was awarded the prize on June 11th. And this is one of his first in-depth interviews on video. We're so honored to have him with us. You will meet him in just a couple of minutes. Please share this with your friends and family. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please share this so that people can meet Professor Lal and talk to him. We'll join him in just a minute. Hello, everyone. I'm Sri. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. Our motto, don't cancel your in-person event without talking to us. Don't even plan your virtual event without talking to us. We've been doing dozens of events a month virtually for organizations big and small around the world. Please get in touch, three at three.net. Thank you all for being here. Today is a very important day, a somber day, as we mark the passing of John Lewis, who died last night. And the rep representative John Lewis was a American icon, an American leader whose passing is a tragedy for all of us. Later today, I will be hosting my Saturday morning show, WBAI, my call-in show. And on it, we'll be talking about Representative Lewis with Mary C. Curtis, journalist and commentator who has been a guest on my other show, The New York Times Read Along. And we'll also later on be talking to Taitun Merriam, founder of the Bronx Mutual Aid Network, poet, poet, activist, and organizer. On the screen there, you see a photograph that I had the honor of taking with Representative Lewis. And that's a picture from 2013. He was a great man. And uh, we met at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund annual gala. And he spent time with me. It was just a few minutes, obviously, a uh, gala with 800 other people. I was the MC with Juju Chang, and we got to talk a little bit, and he made me feel so connected. One of the comments that he made that day that I'll never forget, he said, we all arrived on different ships, but we're all on the same boat now. And that is the situation, as we know, with the crises that are taking place all over this country at this moment. Please tag your friends, please share. And if you have a comment about John Lewis, we'd love to hear it here as well. But you can join me on my WBAI show, which is at 10, uh, sorry, at noon Eastern time. So about three hours from now, noon to two Eastern, we'll be doing call-ins and taking your calls. But you can listen from anywhere in the world on WBAI.org or go to WBAI 99.5 FM, a radio station here in New York City but you can listen and participate from anywhere in the world. And also if you leave your comments here, I will read them on the radio show there as well. Before we start, we want to thank our producers, Vandana Menon and Rose Horowitz. They make it possible for me to do this show every single day, 129 shows in 129 days. We've not missed a single day through this crisis. And as you can see, we've had more than a million viewers, 88 million social impressions, 234 guests from 48 cities in 13 countries. Yesterday, we went to Vegas for the first time. And today, we're going live to a town in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio. And so that will make it city number five zero on the show. We've had doctors, professors, authors, CEOs, nurses, teachers, and all of those folks have made the show what it is today. And so have you. Scroll.in is one of our supporters. They live stream this on their channels. They're more than 2 million followers. 
please check out Scroll.in, one of India's leading news, information, culture, and analysis websites, scroll.in. And before we start, we want to thank our sponsors who make all of this possible. Our sponsors include Muckrack Academy, which has put together this course, a free online course for anybody to take anywhere in the world. Please sign up, Fundamentals of Social Media, free certification, mrac.co slash social, open to any age, any background, any experience, mrac.co slash social. More than 4,000 people have signed up for this class and we hope you will too. We promise you'll learn something doing the course. It's about two hours Netflix style and you can take it right now and you can take it in two hours or you can uh, take it over two months. You have the choice. So that's mrac.co slash social. We also want to tell you about another show that we produce. It's called She's On Call, Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern, and it's on Facebook and on Twitter. Please follow at She's On Call, hosted by two of my surgeon friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian. At Dr. Wendy Sinta and Dr. Tamara Fountain are the guests this Sunday. They're both senior leaders in medicine, and you will get to talk to them about all kinds of aspects of the crisis. So please follow She's On Call tomorrow morning. And before we start, we want to tell you about one last show from our stable of shows. This is called the New York Times Read Along. Every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time, we read the New York Times out loud. Why do we do that? Because we want, we love print. And tomorrow we have our special guest host, Neil Parikh, executive producer of the show. And we'll, our guest is Claire Smith, the first woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame's writer's wing. She's the former New York Times sports columnist and the current editor, news editor of ESPN. So join us Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. If you're wondering why I'm on so early today for the New York Times, for the COVID show, it's because tonight at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, I am doing this. I am hosting Pratham Beyond with Fareed Zakaria of CNN and the Washington Post, Bollywood star Anil Kapoor, playback singer Sean, and the CEO of Pratham, Rukmini Banerjee. Please tune in. You have to register. It's not on my regular channels. You have to register prathamusa.org. It's volunteer-driven fundraising. So whatever you can give and are able to give, please do. PrathamUSA.org, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Please sign up right now so that you can attend and listen to me interview Fareed Zakaria, Anil Kapoor, and Rukmini Banerjee. So don't miss that. Our guest has been waiting very patiently. So let me bring on stage our guest right now. We are going to be talking with Dr. Ratan Lal, winner of the 2020 World Food Prize. Just in June 11th, it was it was announced. He's a professor of soil science at Ohio State University. And we'll talk about soil for food and climate security. We'll talk about the prize. We'll talk about life as a professor, how he's getting ready. We'll talk about his, how his, his years growing up in India, all of that. And it'll start right now. Please bring uh, your warmest greetings. <clears throat> Say hello to Professor Ratan Lal. Hello, Professor. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your patience as we did all that uh, housekeeping before we started. We are sure. delighted to have you here, sir. My first question always is, how are you? How's your family doing through the crisis? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, with the grace of God, uh, we are doing fine. Uh, family doing very well. Uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, professionally, uh, the activities, although done virtually, uh, teaching, uh, professional seminars, meeting, discussion with students, uh, but they are all proceeding very well. Uh, so I'm very happy, very thankful to the God for the blessing. And I hope that this tragedy will also be gone soon with all the efforts uh, being made. Uh, we should be okay. We should come out of it. Well, I like your optimism and that's good to have. We should also say that uh, you won this World Food Prize in the middle of the pandemic. You got the announcement the contest is not, the ceremony will be taking place later. You're not sure if it's going to be physical uh, yet. Is that correct? I think it will be a virtual ceremony, which is really a good idea uh, because the safety is first. 
Uh, that's number one part. Second, uh, we were thinking really I could uh, get there on a private jet. And my concern was that uh, the carbon footprint of flying uh, should be minimized. Uh, I'm very much concerned by climate change issues. So I think virtual is in a way advantage uh, because we do not have to travel. And uh, that to me is very positive. Uh, yet uh, the ceremony kind of uh, highlights the importance of agriculture, the importance of farming community, not only for food, but also for climate and environment. And I'm very fortunate and privileged to have that award. Yeah, we'll talk more about the award in just a minute. You're in Columbus, Ohio, where the university, the Ohio State University, first of all, I've never been sure why they insist on the the like that. Um, I think uh, that is part which is something really somebody in the management might understand uh, <laughs> better can explain. But I think Ohio has many universities and uh, they had to, President Gee, uh, decided that the word the should be there. But I just want to make one statement. Uh, for me, Ohio State University is an institution which has given me identity who I am. And I've been affiliated with Ohio State since 1965. And it's really a privilege and honor to serve my alma mater and to be a teacher uh, at this university. Uh, it's a great uh, organization a great institution for higher learning and it's uh, important for me to be a part of such a global international organization well i could do the math very fast because you said you've been there since 65 i was born in 1970 so you've been there 55 years incredible i want everyone to hear your story how you got here how you became a soil scientist you'll explain what that is all of this folks you're watching right now we're live on facebook twitter YouTube and LinkedIn. Please share this with your friends and family. Tag them. They can watch this live or later. It'll be on these channels right after we're finished so people can join us and uh, learn from uh, Professor Lal. And uh, Professor Lal, I hope you've had a chance to tell your family that you're on this show as well. <laughs> and uh, anybody can join us from around the world. We're just so pleased that you are here with us. Uh, so let's start with the kind of the basics. What is a soil scientist? and what are you teaching there? And how did you come to become an expert on this? And why should we care about all this? So let's start very basic. What is a soil scientist? Well, a uh, soil scientist is a person who study the property processes management of soil as a medium, in my case, for agricultural use. Um, People sometimes do not understand uh, the difference between soil and dirt. Uh, soil is a living entity. Soil is something that creates life. I, in fact, the first part I explained to my student, uh, there is no life without soil and no soil without life. And from a little bit of a spiritual perspective, when people talk about uh, reincarnation and rebirth and transformation of death into life. As far as I know, soil or the rhizosphere where the roots and soil interface meets is the only place we know in the universe where death is transformed into life. So soil has divine powers of giving life. Uh, it is that important. Uh, so I, as a soil scientist, I teach uh, two classes, three classes, in fact, from this uh, spring. Uh, one is soil physical uh, environment, uh, which means climate, water, air, uh, physical media. I also teach a class on soil and climate, how soil impacts climate and how climate impacts soil. It is not very well recognized that soil is the largest reservoir of carbon uh, in terms of the terrestrial, ocean is much bigger than soil, but in the terrestrial, soil is a very large. So a very minute change in soil carbon stock have a very strong influence on the atmospheric carbon stock and vice versa. If a carbon can be taken out from the atmosphere, put back in the soil, uh, even a small change in soil have a large impact on, on carbon and climate. Uh, 
So the climate moderation uh, is governed by soil. And I'm going to also teach a class along with many colleagues uh, from this spring. And it's called One Health Concept. And One Health Concept is based on the premise that the health of soil, plants, animal, people, and the environment is one and indivisible. In the COVID-19 case, the health of soil, health of environment uh, are all interconnected. So if we want to maintain good environment and good health of soil, plants, animal, people, we must look after soil. So that's what I do as a soil scientist. Thank you so much. We're looking at your School of Environmental and Nat Natural Resources page at The Ohio State University. And here we go. We're looking at all your signature areas, environmental quality and sustainability, food security, climate change and soil carbon, soil degradation and restoration. And your interests include greenhouse gases, soil wetness, uh, sustainable management of soil and water resources, agroforestry, tropical agriculture, agricultural development in the developing world. So a lot of uh, amazing work that you have done and you've gotten so many other prizes in addition to the World Food Prize. You won a big prize last year. Please tell us about that. Uh, last year I got um, two prizes. One is Japan Prize and uh, that is uh, very prestigious. Uh, I was uh, the first one soil scientist ever to receive the prize. I think there were 100 uh, recipients uh, so far and the first time ever a soil scientist received an award. It is presented uh, in the presence of uh, Their Excellency the Emperor and Empress. And uh, after the award, uh, my wife and myself had the honor of having dinner with Emperor and Empress of Japan. Wow. And uh, so this was a very unique uh, privilege. And of course, it comes with um, uh, 5 million yuan, which translates at the moment to about $450,000. So it's a very big money. And I donated that money to promote uh, education and research in soil science at The Ohio State University. Uh, so that was one very big award. I also received a U.S. Avasti IFCO Award from India, uh, which uh, is given by uh, Fertilizer Association. And uh, that comes with 25 lakh rupees award. And that I also designated for uh, education and research, uh, hopefully in India. Uh, right now, I have not yet uh, decided how to promote that. But I think I have many alma maters in India. So hopefully association with them to support some education and teaching. So I'm very fortunate, very privileged. God has been very kind to me. Yeah. And my colleagues and friends around the world have been very kind to me. Well, I hope they're all watching today. And congratulations. And what a wonderful gesture, not just a gesture, an actual act of kindness and and generosity to give away money like that. Uh, we're talking, you know, uh, several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, very few people would do that. Uh, yeah. That comes from your 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 generosity there for sure. We want to uh, go on what we call a global tour, Professor. We have people from around the world watching and we like to see where they're watching from and talking to us. So let's see, uh, from Italy, Claudia is watching. She's in Rome and she was a guest on my show on, on uh, earlier this week when we talked to her about COVID and art and how the arts are trying to survive during this uh, pandemic. What is your favorite memory of Italy? Oh, I have been there many times. I think first time uh, I went there was uh, probably 71. Uh, and uh, then uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization headquarter is in Italy. So I go there uh, quite often, actually. Uh, I'm associated with them uh, in many activities. I have just received uh, a document from them to review on soil organic carbon assessment manual. Uh, very good colleague to work with. Uh, excellent uh, hospitality. Uh, I have very fond memories of Rome. Uh, I was supposed to be there for a meeting this last April. Again, it was canceled because of the COVID issue. There was another meeting supposed to be in July that was also canceled. I think things will hopefully get better and we will get back to normal uh, activity. But I must say that Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations uh, is doing a tremendous job internationally uh, 
to address the issues of food and nutrition. So working with them uh, is a privilege, an honor. Yeah, so you're, you're sending greetings back to Rome for the World yeah. Food Organization. And, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just great. So the, the winner, we're speaking right now to the winner of the World Food Prize 2020, uh, Professor Ratan Lal. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us where you're watching from and please share your comments. And I should ask you, what kind of diet do you follow since you're an expert on food <laughs> and going to Italy? The best part to me always is the food of Italy, the people of Italy, the food. They, I tell people that tomatoes in Italy taste better than any tomatoes you've had anywhere in your life. I've got, I had the honor of going multiple times just last year. I've been going since I was a kid to Italy, but uh, going. Uh, I went to Tuscany for the first time and just loved it. And the tomatoes tasted better there. I don't know if I was imagining it. Tell us, Professor, is it my imagination? Um, no, I think you're very right. The climate has a tremendous impact and uh, the Mediterranean climate, of course, is very good for uh, uh, the quality of the food produced. Uh, you asked me a question, my uh, food habits personally. Uh, food habits are very uh, personal things, so I cannot make any recommendation. I have no intention to doing that. I have been vegetarian all my life. And uh, to me, vegetarianism, plant-based diet has served very well. Um, most of my family is vegetarian. I think uh, it uh, is a nature-friendly food habit. Uh, I think uh, with 7.8 billion people uh, destined to be 9.8 billion by 2050, 11.2 billion by 2100, uh, we have to figure out ways and means on how to feed 11 billion people while uh, reconciling the need for improving the environment and uh, also looking after the planet Earth. We have only one planet, planet A. There is no planet B for us at the moment. Uh, maybe in the future, we might have some settlement at Moon or Mars. But right now, this is it. And I think vegetarian food is uh, something which can meet the nutritional need of 11 billion without excessively taxing uh, the resources, finite resources, fragile resources of this jewel of the universe planet Earth. So I think we should pay a very good uh, attention to what we eat and how environment friendly uh, that food is. And that is what I would suggest. Decision is uh, personal and independent, but always consider where the food comes from. I was asked a few weeks ago to give a lecture to a primary and secondary school teacher. The question was, where does the food come from? Well, it comes from soil, stupid. Where else? <laughs> That's a simple answer. And therefore, we got to respect the planet where the food comes from. Uh, you're so right. You mentioned eating a dinner in Japan with the emperor and empress of Japan. What a life highlight that must have been. I was born in Tokyo 50 years ago, and I know how hard it is. It was to get vegetarian food for my grandmother who came to visit she would ask for vegetarian food and they'd say, yes, completely vegetarian, but there would be fish in it or shrimp in it. So I presume they had a special meal for you. I, I did have a privilege of having a special meal for both me and my wife. And uh, it was very delicious and very nicely done. In fact, when I went there for the announcement of the Japan Prize, uh, the I was with the selection committee, had a, a dinner with them. And the entire menu was vegetarian for everybody, not wow. only for me. And I must say it was done in a very high taste and very high quality. So I uh, have been very privileged uh, having no difficulty at all as long as my hosts know that I'm vegetarian uh, everywhere. Uh, I have been always uh, uh, been very fortunate to be given the best uh, vegetarian food that I could ever expect. So I, I, I have absolutely no concern uh, and I never have. I must also mention that I'm teetotaler. I don't uh, drink either. And I don't think I have ever inhaled or smoked uh, either one of those. So I think uh, to me, those habits have served very well. Well, they have it. Look, you still I'm have recommending them. I'm making no recommendation to anybody. 
I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a medical doctor. But to me, they have been a very good thing, personally. Well, well they were, thank you for uh, sharing that with us. I should say, whatever it's doing, you're doing, you're doing, it's great. You have better hair than me. You have a couple <laughs> of years on me, but you've, uh, you've uh, done very well. And uh, we're, we're so glad to hear that. Uh, before we move on, just one, one question about the awareness of vegetarianism has gone, I think, increased by orders of magnitude in the last few years. Uh, talk about that a little bit. I know you're not making a recommendation, but you say it's better for the planet because it is less environmentally taxing compared to growing animals to eat them. So please talk about that. Yes, I think the uh, there is a lot of awareness. I'm very pleased that the young uh, uh, generation is more and more getting involved in vegetarian. But at the same time, I must mention that uh, I'm concerned that the trend in emerging economy, uh, India is obviously an emerging economy, uh, the rate of increase from vegetarian that traditionally Indian diet is, uh, to animal-based diet is increasing as much as 15% per year. And um, it can be advantageous uh, in some respect because animal industry obviously is an important component of economy uh, and it should be uh, supported. But I think the diet is something we want to make sure that uh, it is healthy. A healthy balanced combination uh, is a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure whether meat three times a day is the best option. I think only a nutritionist can tell. But I believe a judicious combination, a good choice of plant and animal-based diet rather than having an excessive animal-based diet is really the best way to go. And I'm very pleased that the trend is in uh, globally is in good direction. But uh, the tendency uh, when you're getting more affluent uh, to become non-vegetarian, uh, it should be very carefully, critically, objectively thought about. So tell us in terms of, you have you gotten pushback from our Ohio friends who are, of course, many of them are uh, non-vegetarian and you get invited to cookouts and barbecues and all of that? <laughs> uh, no, I have none, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, not, nothing of that time, my friends. Uh, and colleagues are very considerably uh, generous and thoughtful. Uh, I'm also not very much uh, involved in parties, uh, even in good times. These days, of course, none at all. Uh, but no, I am not under any kind of pressure. My uh, social circle, professional circle, they are all very um, careful, very knowledgeable, uh, very understanding, very flexible. I'm very fortunate from that point of view. That, that, that is awesome. Let's take a little tour as we were doing before. We only got to one, one of our comments, so let's do some more. Rajan is watching from Long Island, New York. You've spent time in New York, I'm sure. Yes. Tell us about your favorite memories of New York. Um, very nice, very historic. Um, I have visited several uh, academic institutions, uh, uh, Columbia and other places. Uh, Danon uh, Yogurt Company has an office just outside of uh, New York. Uh, I uh, have not seen many social uh, events, but I have gone to many times to uh, United Nations office. Uh, it's a very uh, important, impressive uh, global institution. I have given a couple of times uh, lectures there, uh, of course, related to climate, food and agriculture. So I have very good memories. Uh, Travel-wise, uh, I always travel internationally through New York uh, Airport, uh, which is very handy. So I have very good memories of uh, probably dozen of visits annually uh, through New York. That's that's great. Let's uh, let's keep looking at some of these comments coming in. Rupa says so true. We have another viewer from Long Island. Linda is watching. <clears throat> uh, and uh, uh, we have Vandana, who is our producer, who's, who, who worked with you to uh, bring you here. She's uh, linked to the World Food Prize website. And uh, Rick has a question for you. And Rick's question is, can you share your opinion about the effects of soil erosion on climate change? What can be done in the USA? 
very good professional question. Uh, in fact, uh, I really appreciate that question. Uh, soil erosion impacts globally about uh, 1,100 million hectare for water erosion, 0.6 million, uh, 0.6 billion hectare, 1,100 million hectare water and 550 million hectare wind erosion. Uh, total amount of sediment transported by the rivers of the world uh, is right now more than 37 gigaton. Uh, that's the sediment transport by erosion uh, into the world rivers. And these sediments, uh, both water and wind blown, carry organic matter preferentially because organic matter is much lighter in density. And therefore, its density is uh, 0.3, 0.4 gram per cubic centimeter compared with water one compared with soil sediment particle density of 2.7 so organic matter is preferentially removed and technically we call enrichment ratio of sediment is much greater than where it came from my estimate has been that the sediment borne organic matter re-emitted in the atmosphere because of decomposition uh, contributes more than one gigaton of carbon just by water erosion alone. Now, it is true that part of the sediment laden carbon, which is carried into depressional sites, into aquatic ecosystem, and eventually buried in ocean, goes out of circulation, but that's a small part. Majority part soil erosion is a source of greenhouse gases. So initially in the 70s, 60s, we were thinking erosion control primarily to improve water quality, sedimentation, loss of fertility. But since 1990s, we know that accelerated erosion is also a source of gases, especially methane and nitrous oxide under anaerobic condition. Therefore, we must have effective erosion control policy. And while we are talking about it, uh, especially from the US perspective, the question comes from an audience from the U.S. In the U.S., we have a soil quality, uh, I'm sorry, uh, air quality act. Uh, we have a water quality act. We have no soil quality or soil health act. And I would question professionally, is it possible to have a good water quality and good air quality without having healthy soil quality? Therefore, it is a time that we thought about going back to US Senate, going back to Congress and saying, we also need a healthy soil act. And if US have those trinity of act, healthy soil act, healthy air act, healthy water act, the world will follow us as an example. And that's the way to go. Okay, we love hearing your thoughts on how to think about improving and saving, I think, this planet. And we're so grateful. I want to read for everyone right now the citation for the World Food Prize 2020. He just received it on June 11th, 2020, in the middle of this pandemic. And it says, Dr. Ratan Lal, native of India and a citizen of the United States, will receive the 2020 World Food Prize for developing and mainstreaming a soil-centric approach to increasing food production that restores and conserves natural resources and mitigates climate change. Over his career spanning more than five decades in four continents, Dr. Lal has promoted innovative soil saving techniques, benefiting the livelihoods of more than 500 million smallholder farmers, improving the food and nutritional security of more than 2 billion people and saving hundreds of millions of hectares of natural tropical ecosystems. Incredible uh, sentences I've been reading there uh, for everybody to hear that. Uh, as you said, this is you've you've had um, the benefit of uh, of of your you know you said God's grace. I'm sure your family and your colleagues, all of them, are are so happy and rejoicing at the moment that you won this prize. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, how um, did they tell you? Did you get an email? Do you get a call? How does that work? Thank you. Uh, yes, I received a call. Uh, late in January, in fact, uh, from the president of the World Food Prize Foundation. And uh, frankly speaking, I wasn't expecting a call uh, of that uh, uh, nature. So it was a great surprise indeed. 
my immediate reaction was, gee, wait a minute, let me make sure that I'm awake and not daydreaming. Um, it's, it's a great uh, honor, but I must uh, say a couple of things. One, I have been very fortunate, had 115 graduate students from around the world who did their MSc and PhD thesis research with me. I had almost 60 postdoctoral researchers from around the world who did their postdoctoral research with me. I have uh, several uh, dozens, so maybe at least uh, 12, 15 research scientists. And I had almost 200 visiting scholars from around the world who came to my lab for six months, three months, one year uh, to do their research. And when they go back, uh, they are doing the same research that we had done in Ohio. So I have been privileged to have 350 to 400 scientists from around the world who worked with me. So when I received the Japan Prize or World Food Prize, I'm receiving on behalf of all of my colleagues. That is why the money that I received, I donated back for the research. Uh, I'm representing the soil science community globally, uh, who through me is being recognized and I'm accepting those awards for them. And I want to thank all of them for giving me the privilege of working and representing them and receive these awards on their behalf. That is so nice to hear. And you're, again, your generos generosity is incredible. We have people watching from all over the world. Uh, we, are, we are grateful to have your comments. And everyone who's watching, please say hello. Uh, Lori is watching from Dobbs Ferry, uh, just north of New York City. Jonathan Borstein is watching. Jonathan has been a dedicated viewer. He has watched all 129 episodes from Union Square in the East Village which has its own tradition of vegetarian cuisine. He's uh, saying that to us. Mark Lee is watching from Durham, North Carolina. And he says, uh, he's tagged a friend and says, you should check out this show. And, uh, and uh, Jan, I guess, is running for soil and water office in Durham, North Carolina. It's an elected uh, post, I guess. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. And everyone watching, you know somebody who's interested in the environment, who's interested in saving the planet. Please tag them in this conversation. Please retweet. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. And for those of you who are just tuning in, I should also tell you that we started this session by paying tribute to John Lewis, the, uh, the congressman who died uh, yesterday at the age of 80, an incredible man whose legacy we will be celebrating later today on my show, where we will be talking about his work this is my radio show. I host every uh, every single Saturday from noon to two. It's called Coping with COVID-19, a helpful, hopeful call-in show. And our guest will be Mary C. Curtis, journalist and commentator. And we will also be meeting in the second hour, Talitun Merriam, founder of the Bronx Mutual Aid Network. Anybody from anywhere in the world can participate, WBAI.org, or if you're in the New York City area, 99.5 FM, listener supported WBAI progressive radio. So please join us if you can, noon to 2 p.m. Eastern. That's about two and a half hours from now. And we are continuing our conversation. There you see a photograph of me with Reverend, uh, with Representative John Lewis, and there he is. We met at the All Deaf Dinner, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund Dinner that I'm honored to emcee every year for the last dozen years or so, and he was incredible. This was in 2013, and his sentence that he uttered that I will never forget, he said, we all came by different ships to this country, but we're all in the same boat now. And we certainly are, as we consider the extent of the crises in this country, the economic crisis, the medical crisis, the healthcare crisis, and of course, the racial inequality crisis. And we will continue to address all of those on this show that has been on the air right now for 125, 129 straight days. In the first 125 days, we had more than a million viewers, 234 guests from 48 cities. But today we have our guest from the 59th, 50th city because our guest is Dr. Ratan Lal, professor of soil science and winner of the World Food Prize 2020 and you're calling in from Columbus, Ohio. 
tell us a little bit about Columbus and tell us about Ohio itself. Many people know it as a, a state that has often been a predictor of national politics. <laughs> and you have a governor who is Republican, but has been very quick to shut down and introduce social distancing and in many ways, very different from other Republican governors. So if you don't want to get political, that's perfectly okay. But we'd love to hear your thoughts on Columbus and on uh, Ohio itself. Well, Ohio is a great uh, state. Uh, the climate, uh, the landscape, the uh, everything is very scenic, uh, very uh, nice to drive around the countryside. It's an agricultural state. Uh, one third is uh, unglaciated. Uh, uh, Two thirds is glaciated, flat. Sorry, uh, what does that mean? Can you translate that? Uh, during the last ice age, about uh, 10, 15,000 years back, uh, the Labrador ice sheet had come all the way down to Cincinnati. So as the glacier receded, um, then it created a lot of fertile young soils, two thirds of the Ohio, uh, all the way from Cincinnati um, up and going west to, up to Rocky Mountains in the area. So that's where the glaciation period was. So two thirds of the soils are uh, glaciated. Uh, that's where the ice sheet came. And those are young soil, very fertile. Uh, the one third eastern part uh, is uh, part of the hilly area. That's where the coal and the oil reserves are. Uh, that's where the ice sheet did not uh, come. So it's a very nice uh, landscape uh, covering a lot of eco regions. The city of Columbus uh, right now about, I think, 2 million people, including the metropole. The total population of uh, Ohio is more than 11 million. So the city is uh, really very nice. It has a, a kind of impression of an agricultural uh, part uh, because it's uh, not uh, congested. It's uh, really very nice. Uh, agricultural farm of the Ohio State is, of course, within the city itself. So that gives also a very scenic uh, view of agricultural crops on the campus and within the city area. I think a uh, lot of progressive things have come up uh, out of Ohio. Uh, of course, people would say that uh, aviation originated here as well. But from the scientific uh, university point of view, Ohio State University is perhaps uh, sometime the largest uh, one campus enrollment. We have uh, 65,000 enrollment last year. Uh, that's a very large uh, uh, student body. We have about uh, 3,500 faculty members. We have 18 colleges representing all the discipline. My college, of course, is College of Food, Agriculture, and Environment Sciences. And to say something about the college, uh, the College of Agriculture, uh, which recently, about 10, 15 years ago, named College of Food, Agriculture, and Environment Sciences, have been very actively involved in India, going back to 1955. Uh, our college here was involved at a campus in Punjab. Uh, which had two sub campuses at that time uh, in Solon and in Hisar, which eventually became two separate states. So those made three separate universities that Ohio State was involved. Ohio State was also involved in Rajasthan at uh, Jabal, at um, Udaipur campus. So uh, we have four campuses, agricultural, which were cooperatively developed in the land grant university format by the Ohio State University. And that cooperation, we continue to uh, keep going and strengthening. So I'm very proud that Ohio State has played a very important role in agricultural education and development, but at the same time in bringing about the green revolution in India since the 60s, uh, which is very important to India's food security. So. That's all the plus for Ohio State. And the reason I'm here is because of the linkage between Punjab and Ohio State going back to 55. Thank you. This is a photograph I took in my first visit to Columbus, Ohio at the Ohio State University. The, that's the campus stadium on the left. It can hold 105,000 people. The university has more than 56,000 students on its 1,700 acres and 400 buildings and about 10,000 freshmen each fall. These are stats I wrote in 
2012. I did not have the pleasure of meeting you then, Professor, but I hope if I come back, I get to spend some time with you. That's a very nice picture of the campus. It's a beautiful campus. Thank you. And thank you for uh, sharing about Ohio State. And one of the reasons why Ohio State is uh, so well known is the work it does with the environment as well as with the work to with the farmers, right? The agricultural industry. Uh, talk about the American farmer and uh, his and her success in feeding the world, but also the challenges they are facing today. Thank you. Yes, that's a very, I mentioned Ohio is an agricultural uh, state. Um, about 80,000 farmers, uh, average farm size is about 600 acres. Uh, corn, soybean, primarily the crops. Some of the farmers that I have worked with and have a privilege to know them are exemplary farmers. Uh, absolutely uh, innovative uh, thinking in the modern way of uh, looking at the soil and restoring. Uh, I can give uh, by name a few examples that uh, I'm very proud to know them. Uh, Dr. Mr. Bill Richards, one of the very large progressive farmer uh, whose farm I take many time visitors to see how agriculture should be done. And he does that. He and his uh, sons do that farming uh, very nicely. I know also Dave Brent, who's uh, uh, we had a chance to take a minister of agriculture from France to go and visit his farm. By and large, farmers uh, here represent uh, some of the best practices, very progressive. And the crop yields, uh, corn, for example, getting 10 to 12 tons per hectare. Uh, that's uh, almost uh, five to six tons per acre from that point of view. Soybean also about three tons per hectare. Uh, wheat, three to three and a half tons per hectare. Uh, I think uh, if we can somehow adopt a similar progressive farming throughout the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, our uh, neighbors down in the Central Americas, uh, the Caribbean area, uh, and South Asia, I think the possibility of uh, making sure that uh, the entire growing population can be fed through healthy and nutritious food is very good. So I think Ohio farming community that I feel very proud of, uh, our college has worked uh, very closely with them, very good relation. Uh, some of the progressive farmers serve on the board of trustees, I know they have, and also on the cabinet of the dean, I know that. Uh, certain parts, so there's a dialogue between them, communication, uh, farmers can influence our thinking of the scientific community. And we, of course, seek their advice. We serve them. Uh, farmers are our bosses mm -hmm. uh, in a way because we are being a land grant university. Uh, we do what is good for them. Uh, and therefore, we listen to their opinion. We listen to what they think needs to be done. So this cooperation based on mutual dialogue and understanding is very productive. And uh, land grant institution implies integration of research, education, and extension, scaling up. So those three components are brought together uh, through cooperation, through working with uh, the community. Right now, I have a grant proposal funded by uh, Hoover Foundation. And uh, it is based on working with farmers in Star County. And that uh, is an example of how uh, the funding organization are also encouraging involvement of researcher with, uh, with the farming community. I must also mention that uh, College of Agriculture and our deans, uh, uh, they support us to work with extension very strongly. Uh, I recently had a dialogue with our dean who I was very pleased to hear. Uh, she said, uh, we will have more support for my research in particular to work with farming community scaling up. So these are very, very progressive thinking from the, uh, the decision maker at the college level, university level, and the farmers cooperation uh, that very exemplary. And I hope this kind of example can be adopted elsewhere in the developing world as well. 
Sure. Thank you, Professor. We only have a few minutes left with you. We have so many questions and comment, uh, comments coming in, so I'm going to do short questions and short answers, if that's okay. I want to remind everyone that tonight I'll be hosting a very special event, Pratham Beyond. You're invited to the National Fundraising Gala. I'll be interviewing Fareed Zakaria of CNN and the Washington Post and Rukmini Banerjee, the CEO of Pratham, and Anil Kapoor, the famous Bollywood star, will all be there tonight, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. You have to sign up because this is not a show on my channels, prathamusa.org. Please go there and register right now. It's free. They would love to get a donation if you can afford it, prathamusa.org. They have so many fantastic events. I had a chance to interview Tom Friedman a couple of months ago for Pratham. Please check out prathamusa.org and go to their national fundraising gala tonight. Fareed Zakaria, Anil Kapoor, and Rukmini Banerjee, and the playback singer, Sean, will be there as well. So prathamusa.org, that's at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. That's why we're on so early this morning. And in a few minutes, our friend Stefan Kaplan will be hosting his show. It's called The Spin It Social Hour, and Simi Joyce will be the guest on that show. She's on Instagram at Culinary Optics, and they'll talk about photography and social media. So if you want to get a head start, you can head over there. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your support of all our online activities. And tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. Eastern, our Sunday New York Times read along, where we read the New York Times every Sunday out loud like crazy people. Neil Parekh, our guest host, will be there as also our executive producer. And our guest is Claire Smith, the first woman inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame's writer's wing and former New York Times columnist, and now the current editor of ESPN, the news editor of ESPN. So check all of that out on our shows. Thank you, Professor Lal. Let's go to some of the questions that have come in. Here's one. The question is, uh, Ratan, sir, please share your views on countering land degradation. How effective would the initiatives of UNCCD. What is the UNCCD? Oh, thank you. Thank you. United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And I happen to be a member of the Sol Policy Interface. Their headquarters in Bonn, Germany, and they have adopted a program called Land Degradation Neutrality. The idea is anywhere where this land is degraded by erosion, salinization, uh, there should be an equivalent amount restored somewhere. And India is signatory to that. I think that's a great cause. I wrote a position paper for that along with Uriel Safril from Israel and Ben Bohr from Sydney, Australia. And we call that zero net land degradation. And this is a great concept. And in the uh, interest of saving time, I would say, please support this idea that if we degrade land somewhere, we must restore an equivalent land elsewhere to make sure that the net land degradation is zero. That's in sum, uh, it's a very great idea. Very good question. Whoever is asking, I thank you for your knowledge. <laughs> thank you. That was a really good question. And I'm so glad that people are able to hear your thoughts on this. Folks, we're talking to Dr. Ratan Lal, winner of the World Food Prize 2020. And this is the 129th episode of our daily program where we have been on the air talking about different aspects of this crisis. Let's keep going. My wife is watching from the 28th floor. She sends her regards, Professor. Uh, we are, I'm in a different, off, uh, different apartment so that I can be loud on a Saturday morning like this and at night. Basu Duivedi asks, your views on, uh, so that's the question we already got. That was Basu whose question had come in. Mark says, food deserts are so big in this area. He's in North Carolina. In some ways, the ancients like those in South America did a better job of making sure we're all fed in this society. What lessons in terms of irrigation and other things can we learn from the ancients? Great question, Mark. Very good, uh, excellent question. Irrigation developed about 8,000 years ago. Uh, we have almost 350 million hectare under irrigation out of which 70 million hectare in India. The trouble is we are using flood irrigation. Uh, it is changing rapidly, it should change. India, for example, uses 200 kilometer cube of water every year for irrigation. We cannot afford wasting that much water. 
we must switch to micro irrigation. We can expand the area under irrigation, but reduce the water loss uh, for irrigation purposes. I think it's subsidizing irrigation so people can use electricity as much as they want probably should be changed to subsidizing micro irrigation. So irrigation is a one way to go, but I must also mention, I said 800 million, 20, 820 million worldwide, 40 million of that are in the US. Out of that 40 million undernourished in the US, 2 million are in Ohio. Out of the 2 million in Ohio, half a million are children under five, not having adequate amount of nutritious food. Even one child going to bed hungry is unacceptable. Therefore, we must do whatever we can to make sure everybody has enough and adequate nutritious food. Food is the basic human right. And we must respect that right for everybody on the planet Earth. Thank you. We'll go with a few more questions. And uh, again, short questions, short answers. What do you think of intensive use of pesticides in agriculture? And how do you think people can deal with it as organic products are so expensive to buy for common people? We must minimize the use of pesticides. There's no question about that. Uh, pesticides are, uh, but please also remember the difference between poison and remedy is a dose. So judicious use of pesticide, targeted precision pesticide use is needed. Uh, and this is where I also come from GMOs. If BT gene can uh, remove the use of pesticide and decrease it, I realize it will have some natural pesticidal properties on its own. But I think it's a trade-off we must think about. Use organic pesticide. Neem, for example, in India is a very good organic pesticide. But by and large, have a judicious use minimize it as much as you can. Do not use it ad hoc and indiscriminately. Thank you. Well, let's see, Jaydeep Jadav says, can you note on in, any Indian fertilizer company's growth after COVID-19? So what is the, in, how is the Indian fertilizer business? I think it's going very well. India uses 165 kilogram per hectare of fertilizer. Uh, US uses much less than that. China uses about 400 kilogram in many parts of, uh, I think our efficiency of fertilizer used in India is hardly 30%. So I would encourage industry to use formulation which increase efficiency uh, from 30%. If we can increase the efficiency to 70, 80%, we can reduce the rate of fertilizer. Just like I mentioned about pesticide, fertilizer should also be used judiciously, prudently and properly so that we do not pollute the environment. Uh, they, as I mentioned, the difference between remedy and poison is the dose. Be careful how you apply, when you apply, and at what rate you apply. Minimize the rate, increase the efficiency. I like that idea, the difference between remedy and, uh, and, and you say science poison. is, and poison. Poison. remedy and poison is <laughs> a dose, dose. Right? just a dose. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 cures mind. you the headache. 100 aspirin, you know what they do. They cure most things. Right, exactly. Well, I'm glad you're hydrating, sir. Very important. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, let's let's keep going here. So many questions and comments coming in. Uh, Mark has registered for my event with Farid Zakaria. And, uh, and Rajan says, apparently at least 25 of the American astronauts have come from Ohio. So that, <laughs> that tells you something about Ohio. Chris Gorman is watching from New York City. Uh, glad to have you. Uh, and... Uh, uh, what got Anil Nair asks, what got Professor Lal interested in soil? I'm a, I came from a farming family in uh, near close to Cathal around Jean area, small farm. You know how Indian farms are five acre, seven acre, ten acre. And in the 50s, when I was on the farm, bullock driven, I have been through dust storms, through drought, uh, through uh, the locust. Uh, I remember locust incidences uh, quite a lot. So and puddling, I remember uh, transplanting rice in puddles. I remember the drought issue. So for me, soil has been from the very beginning a very critical component of agriculture uh, because of my background and also religious background because we consider soil Vasundra, uh, Dharti Mata, uh, its Mata, Mother Earth. 
uh, and we should consider it properly as a mother earth. So for me, soil has been, and this is why I'm very glad my award for World Food Prize was based on the soil centric approach, which is supposed to be complementary to seed centric approach. So both are, it's not either or, we need both. And uh, thank you. This is natural to me being a soil scientist. Laurie says the difference between remedy and poison is dose. Brilliant, she says. And uh, Rajan says the precision use of pesticides seems wiser than what has been historically done. These are just comments coming in from everywhere. We're so glad. Uh, Mark says he was, uh, I remember growing up with 4-H was a very big part of learning about agriculture. Wonder if these kinds of programs have fallen off in terms of popularity. Please tell us about 4-H and what it is and why it's important. Uh, head, heart, uh, health, and um, uh, four components. Uh, we still have a very strong 4-H program in Ohio. Uh, I think it's uh, very good. It must need to be continued. It brings in young people to know that farming is a good profession. Uh, as far as I know, at Ohio State, uh, 4-H, in the building, we have 4-H building is one of the most uh, um, excellent modern uh, innovative designs, a very nice building. So activity is very good. I think it should continue. While we are talking about Ohio State and uh, uh, the um, astronauts, I'm very, very uh, fond of Senator John Glenn. In fact, he's my hero. In, at 77, he went into the space. So um, that's the kind of heroism uh, we need. So we have very good example of from Ohio State, not only for 4-H, but also for Senate and other uh, innovative ideas. And that's that's great. We're looking at uh, learning more. There's a great question that has come in, Professor, from Linda Lawrence, who asks the question, how can non-scientists like herself help improve healthy soil? Thank you. Very good question, indeed. Each one of us is a culprit and victim of not looking after the soil and land properly. So um, not wasting food. Uh, we waste at least 30% food even in this country. Uh, and most of it is wasted between the grocery store and the dinner table. In developing countries like India, food is wasted in the, in the, uh, in the field, uh, uh, post-harvest losses and storage issues. So each one of us can save food, can save energy, can save water, and never ever take gifts of God these natural resources are granted and we can make a difference. Incremental improvement by 8 billion people can make a whole of lot of difference in planet Earth. So please do not undermine your contribution. That's, that's excellent. So, so glad to hear it. Uh, so you were talking about John Glenn going to space at 77. You are turning 76 this year, I understand. Is that correct? I'm, I'm still very young, yes. You've got, you've got lots, of, lots of time to do interesting things. What is on your list of things to do when you come out of the pandemic, when you can travel again? Give us your uh, list of things. And do you keep a bucket list of things you want to do generally in life? We had a guest who doesn't like the word bucket list because then he says you'll be kicking the bucket. So he said life list. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on both immediately well, the, travel and generally, did you keep a list when you were growing up? Do you have a list like that now? I did have actually things because uh, I, even this morning I had a list of what things I'd like to accomplish today. So I tick mark what I get done. So I do that. It is more like a habit of what I must get done and what I cannot do today that will wait till tomorrow, but I do have that list. Uh, and I keep that on a very regular basis. Um, my goal has been to serve the farming community of the world, of the world, uh, both uh, the large scale farmers like we have North America, uh, Brazil, Latin America, and the small landholders, which we have rest of the world, uh, 500 to 700 million. I came from one of those farmers. I represent them. I'm very proud of them. My goal is, to serve them in whatever way I can. And if it involves travel to places uh, in India or uh, South America or Africa, uh, I will do so. Um, but the principal objective to serve them, and if I can serve them while being here, 
through communication, through IT system, through Zoom, uh, so be it, uh, through publication, through lectures, uh, through dialogue, through learning. I also consider them as a source of knowledge because they have experience, they have wisdom, they have traditional background. So listening to their views is very important to me. So that's my goal, to be of service to farmers of the world. You have been for so many years. You've helped hundreds of millions of farmers. The World Food Prize said you have helped feed 2 billion people. Vedant Bhargava writes, hello, I'm going to make a career in agricultural scientists, sciences. You are a great inspiration, sir. I love to see that. And then we have a comment here and a question from Nikhil Hathi Singh. And you'll recognize the name Hathi Singh from the yes. great Nehru family. Yes. yes. And, uh, and Nikhil asks, do you have a view on the impact of aerosols on soil land degradation? Are measures being taken to counter any ill effects? Um, anything aerosol, which are chemicals, of course, uh, we should be very careful about. Uh, if you remember Montreal Protocol, I think it was 1977, uh, Freon, which is not the, the example of aerosol, but Freon was uh, the used as a cooling, as a refrigerating substance. And we were very successful in eliminating the use of Freon. Uh, we need similar uh, a kind of awareness. I do not want to keep going back to legislation all the time but we need awareness, we need education uh, to people that to be careful uh, what you put in the environment. Barry Kamner had a book called The Closing Circle and that book had four chapter and one chapter was, there is no way to throw away. Everything must go somewhere. Uh, Mother nature knows best and there is no such thing as a free lunch. Everything has a price. And sometimes the price is ecological price. Ecological price is much more expensive than economic prices. Please use environment carefully. Do not treat it as a common. When we put aerosols, smoke, soot, dust, other things into the atmosphere environment, that we treat them as a common and tragedy of the common is what is causing the issues. Take care. Do not take them for granted. Thank you so much. We have many more questions. We won't have time for all of them, but just a couple of more comments that we want to see. Mark says, unfortunately, and I'm as guilty as many of us, we waste too much of the great food we get by either not eating it all or letting it go to waste before it spoils. How many of us really pay attention to the shelf life of food when we buy them? So a question for you, Professor, is what can we do individually? You said incremental changes by seven billion people can make changes. Give us one, two, three things we can do starting today in our homes. Thank you. Uh, food waste is a crime against nature. Please take what you need. Do not take more than what you can chew and digest and eat. Uh, throwing things into the landfill is a triple jeopardy. First, we wasted the energy resources other to produce it. B, it's a very precious thing which many people go without it. And third, when we take it to the landfill, it emits gases, greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, pollutes water resources. So it's a triple jeopardy. It also indicates that we do not value that resource properly. From a religious point of view, uh, I was brought up with the philosophy, Anna Bhagavan. It's a food is a God and it is a God. How can you waste a God? So please uh, do not waste food. Uh, consider it very carefully. Our purchasing, uh, do not purchase more than what you need and do not uh, waste it. Uh, wasting uh, does not matter which religion you take, but uh, looking at, uh, I read part of Quran verses, uh, Allah does not like the wastefulness. Very nicely said, please do not waste. We must stop. If we do not waste food, we don't need to produce more. That's as simple as that. And can you talk about organic food? If you're in the if you're in the store and you see an organic tomato versus a regular tomato, organics are more expensive. Some people say it's not necessary to buy organic. Some people say you must. Where do you come down on that? Uh, if uh, our population, rather than 7.8 billion, was three to four billion, organic agriculture would have been the best option. Uh, Organic agriculture at the moment uh, has some yield reduction 
maybe 15 percent, maybe 20 percent. Uh, so that is an issue. But over the long term, if our population can stabilize and come down to 4 billion, 5 billion, eventually, maybe by 2200, uh, 2100, we are still going up by 11.2 billion. Uh, our priority, me as an agronomist, the priority is to make sure everybody is in a food. So a judicious use of chemical, judicious use, integration with organic, probably is the best way to go rather than saying thou shall not use the chemical. We may have to use them properly. Remember, we are going back to dose versus poison. So reduce the chemical use as much as you can, but do not make it illegal. Thou shall never use it because we have too many people to feed. Uh, I think that is the best I can say. Uh, but yes, organic matter added to the soil is a good for soil. Thank you, Professor. We must let you go. We've been very patient with us as we've talked for so long. You've enjoyed 15 minutes early. We can't let you go without asking what's the, what are the pins on your jacket? So talk about well, that. I First of all, my tie is Ohio State tie. and uh, pin is Ohio State logo. And this is the Japan prize uh, uh, logo, uh, which I received uh, last year. Uh, when I got the food prize, uh, and if they have a logo, I certainly put that one as well. Yesterday, I was very fortunate to be given uh, by EECA. EECA is Inter-American Institute of Agriculture and Cooperation, based in Costa Rica. And they gave me a title of uh, Chair of Soil Science, EECA Chair of Soil, and uh, Goodwill Ambassador for Sustainable Development. So if they give me a logo, I will certainly put that one also. I represent Ohio State. Japan Prize, World Food Prize, Eka, and other organizations. I am their ambassador. It's a privilege to show those colors. Wonderful. Oh, you wear them. I can see you wear your love for the earth, not just in your on your lapels, but on your heart. We can see it. It's so clear and so grateful. Terry says, food wasted is a crime against nature. And Linda says, thank you for an extremely interesting show. Your guest is a treasure. Thank you for sharing him with us. We're, we're so glad that, Linda, you were able to join us and everybody around the world. Please share this. Please tag your friends and family so that they can get to meet the, Dr. Ratan Lal, Professor of Soil Science at The Ohio State University. Uh, we, I want to tell you once again that this is how the World Food Prize described his, his, his work. His career spanning more than five decades and four continents, Dr. Lal has promoted innovative soil saving techniques benefiting the livelihood of 500 million smallholder farmers, improving food and nutritional security for more than 2 billion people. I'm just so amazed that you were able to spend time with us today. My grandfather in Kerala was a farmer and uh, his, his children uh, grew up on a farm and I had the honor of being with him and spending time and uh, you know, helping him in the paddy fields when I was a child. It was one of the things I look, look forward to when I went back to Kerala to, uh, to spend time on the farm with him. Professor, thank you so much for your time, your insights. I'm so, so grateful to you. I want anybody who wants to take a photo uh, of, of you to do so right now and please post it. Professor Lal is a treasure indeed. And you can follow him on Twitter and you can follow the World Food Prize as well and uh, the Ohio State University. Thank you very much, Professor. We'll say goodbye now. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye. That was Professor Russell Lau. Thank you so much for everybody for watching. We love your feedback. We love your comments. We love your thoughts on how we can continue to do the show. We've seen that we have been on the air for 129 days later on this uh,
and she said, say their names, say her name, and we will be doing that in just a minute. First, let's tell you all the shows and things that we have coming up, and we are so grateful to all of you for your support as we do these. So right now, you have seen this conversation with Professor Ratan Lal, you can share this right now. You tag it, it'll start again as soon as we're done. And then later on at noon Eastern, I will be interviewing and talking to folks on my WBAI radio show, 99.5 FM in New York, WBAI worldwide. Please join us as we pay tribute to Representative John Lewis. You can see a photograph of me with him. Mary C. Curtis will be here, journalist and commentator as well as Taitun Mariam. She's the founder of the Bronx Mutual Aid Network and poet, activist, and organizer. And we'll be taking your calls about John Lewis in about le less than two hours. So please join us if you can. Then to tonight I am hosting this very special program, Pratham Beyond. I am interviewing Farid Zakaria of CNN and the Washington Post. I'm interviewing Anil Kapoor, the Bollywood star, and Dr. Rukmini Banerjee, the CEO of Pratham. Please join us. It is not on my channels. You have to register. It is free. PrathamUSA.org. PrathamUSA.org. You can donate if you are able to. They are grateful for any donation you can give. PrathamUSA.org. But it is free and available to everybody. But you must register. So that's my day today. And tomorrow, our guest host, Neil Parekh, the executive producer, will be hosting the New York Times read along with Claire Smith, the first woman inducted into the Baseball right, Fall Hall of Fame writer's wing, former New York Times baseball columnist and the uh, current ESPN news editor. So please check her out and the whole conversation tomorrow, very early at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, will be five years of reading the New York Times out loud. And then in the evening, we will have another special episode because we will have a chance to talk to our friend. I'll show you right now. We're doing our Sunday positivity show. That's what we do on Sunday, trying to be positive in the middle of everything that's going on. Tim Salau will be here. You can see he's a generally positive person. On Sunday nights, we try to be positive despite every rotten thing going on. We meet generally positive, purposeful people who can help us get ready for the week. We might cry together, laugh together, mourn together, get angry together, but we'll definitely learn together. And Tim is known as Mr. Future of Work. So please do join us and check him out on Twitter. Tim Salau will be our guest. He's the founder of Guide App and someone who can talk about the future of work. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Now we shall say their names. We started doing this because Kimberly Crenshaw asked us to do it. And here we have on the screen, I'm gonna first tell you how we used to do it most of the time, by reading the names on this Titus Kaffer cover story of Time Magazine, stunning for, uh, portrait that he made, painting, and on the right, is a photograph I will never forget. That's a young George Floyd on the lap of his mother, Larcinia Floyd, who would die two years ago, almost to the day that he would be killed in Minneapolis. They are now buried together next to each other in Houston. Now let's say her name. These are the names on the Say Her Name report. Brianna Taylor. These are the names of people killed in police action. Brianna Taylor killed by police in her bed on March 13, 2020. Tatiana Jefferson, Sharlina Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Pearlie Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith, Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kayam Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Fry, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, 
Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Cherise Francis, Aliana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Catherine Johnston, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, and Eleanor Bumpers. If you've not heard of most of those names, that tells you something about the situation we're in now, and that's part of the reason we say their names. And I will say something that I've said occasionally, I don't say it all the time. I'm the son, uh, son-in-law of a police officer, someone who led, uh, who, who believed in the power of the justice system. And so I'm not saying police officers are bad, the opposite. We expect police officers to be better than everyone. We hold them to a higher standard. No one is judge, jury, and executioner. That is something that we have a system for. And no matter what these folks could be accused of, or they were just standing by, nothing happening, they didn't do anything, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. We hold them, we hold the police to a higher standard. That's the end of our show. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget to sign up for my conversation this evening with CNN's Fareed Zakaria and Bollywood star Anil Kapoor, Rukmini Banerjee, the CEO of Pratham and Sean, a playback singer and big Hollywood, Bollywood star singer. PrathamUSA.org, you have to register for this to, in order to be able to participate. So please register, it's free, PrathamUSA.org. Thank you so much everyone for being here with us. We have such great comments that have come in from all over the world. We are so grateful for every comment and every person who has taken the time. Here's a comment that has just come in from Rhonda. All that you need to say. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you soon. We expect you to be joining us if you can. We're live every single day, mostly at 9 p.m. Eastern, and certainly otherwise at noon Eastern. We're on extra early today. Thanks very much, everybody. The show starts again on all these channels right now. Bye-bye.